Will you please pray with me? God, we ask that it is you that we hear and feel in these words and in this place. Please open us to seeing and then heeding your warnings. Amen. With the All Daughters Banquet quickly approaching, and the theme being the unsinkable Molly Brown, I thought I'd share with you um, a little story about the Titanic, kind of get you pumped up for a week and a day from today. Read that on the evening of April 14th, radio operators on the Titanic received a message that they were heading toward a dangerous ice field. Now, the operators at that time were busy sending messages from the passengers to loved ones back home about the great time that they were having on the Titanic. And they set aside the warning message so that they could complete this more important task. Later that evening, a radio operator from a nearby ship also sent a message warning about the ice field. And one of the radio operators answered back by Morse code saying, Shut up, shut up, I'm busy. We all know what happened. Why is it that we often ignore the warnings in our lives until it's too late? We all do it. You might be thinking right now, oh, I know somebody who's like that, but really, we all do it. We ignore the toothache until we need a root canal. We pay the minimum on our credit card until we can't afford the payments at all. We stop communicating with our spouse until our marriage is over. We think we can have one more supersized humongo meal until our heart stops or our brain hemorrhages. We think we can hit snooze one more time until we are late. I think you realize now that we all ignore the warnings at times in our lives. The northern kingdom of Israel, which we talked about last week, and, and we can see here on the map, and the map that you have, the northern kingdom of Israel ignored God's warnings for over 200 years. And the Assyrians came, and they ended the reign of their kings and exiled them. They intermarried them on this map here. On the next slide on the map, you can see how they end up getting taken and exiled into Assyria. The whole northern kingdom is wiped off of the face of the earth, and their heritage is lost forever. So now we turn to the southern kingdom. Last week we read about how Judah was able to fight off the Assyrians with God's amazing help, but then a new king came into power at age 12, and that king is Manasseh. And as we read this week, Manasseh is an evil man. Manasseh did more evil in the eyes of God than any other king ever. Not king of Israel. Scripture says any other king. On the story page 231 and 2 Kings 21, 2 through 6, we can read some of his ways. We can read... He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. In the two courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced divination, sought omens, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. This is not a good guy. And he pushes Judah down a a 100-year path that will see the kingdom fall, Jerusalem raided, the people killed, and the nation punished. But not all of the last six kings of Judah were bad. One was good. King Josiah, who came to power as an eight-year-old, was a good king who followed God, but he wasn't good enough to redeem all of the people. I've given you a little genealogy that you can follow along to see all of the kings of Israel, from the unified kingdom to the divided kingdoms, all the way through until the exile of Judah. 
In 2 Chronicles 36, 15 through 16, we can read a summary of this entire era of Judah and their sinful ways. And it reads, The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again, because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people, and there was no remedy. Through all of this time, God sent prophets to try to bring the people back. But they just scoffed. There seemed to be no remedy, so God has to do something. How can the world know the Lord through a people who won't even listen and disobey at every chance they get? So again, God calls the prophets to speak the truth and try to sway the people away from their sin and into God's arms. And two of these prophets are Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Ezekiel is already exiled in Babylon when he prophesies to Jerusalem and he calls for them to change their ways so that God's mercy could be shown. God needs Judah to fulfill the upper story, and so they're given another chance to heed the warnings. On the story, page 245 in Ezekiel 36, 22 through 23, we read, It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. God still needs us. It's through the people that the world will know God. God needs us, the people, the call to show the world God's love, forgiveness, truth, and more. God needed Judah, but they kept turning away. At one point, God spoke through Jeremiah to say, if just one good person, just one, could be found in all of Jerusalem that could be spared, it only takes one. But none were found. And so King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came in 586 BCE. And they took Jerusalem. And you can see on the map how they took the southern kingdom. And all of the powerful were exiled to Babylon. Only the poorest of the people were left behind. To see their temple and their city burned to the ground. They waited too long to listen to God. They waited too long to heed the warnings. There's a story about a teacher in Texas that goes, Sally Edwards is a highly esteemed third grade teacher in the Jacksboro Elementary School in a small rural Texas town. And to help her students prepare for important placement exams, she compiles her own exam to test them. And the exam is 20 questions long, and one of the questions is this very simple question. List in order the four seasons. The results of that question from a rural town in Texas, 67% of the third graders listed the seasons as season, deer season, quail season, and turkey season. <laughs> in some areas of Ohio, you might be able to find something similar. Are these students wrong? Not really. But they've missed the essence of the question. When God calls for us and we misunderstand that call, it may seem that we're wrong. But it really means we need to discern more, learn more, pray more, follow more, listen to the warning signs more. Which is a big reason why we've been moving through the story. So we can get as seamless as possible a story of God so that we might understand it a little bit better. Because some people think an epistle is the wife of an apostle. Some people think that one of the Ten Commandments is freedom of speech. Others list the Gospels as Matthew, Mark, Luther, and John. See the reasons on why we need to do this. 
We need to learn the Bible together and see how it applies to our everyday lives so that we might better understand those warnings in our life and how to react to them. This week we get to see what happens when even the people who are central to God's upper story disobey and wander. They are punished. They have to be punished so that the world will know that God is a just God to all. God made promises to Abraham and Moses that he would show his love to all people and call them back to himself. To David, God promised to bring the Messiah. And even though God's people failed to obey and the kingdom split into two smaller, weaker kingdoms, God still will fill this unconditional promise. But now Judah is gone as well. So what will happen? How can the Messiah come from the tribe of Judah and the lineage of David if Judah isn't around anymore? So God sends the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was destined to speak for God. In Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5, you can read that God calls to Jeremiah while he is still in the womb. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Then, as Jeremiah grew, he made excuses as to why he couldn't possibly be called by God. So God tells him in verses 9 through 10 of that same chapter that God will supply his word. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Jeremiah gives in and follows God's call. Even though the task before him was impossible, Jeremiah was to speak to Judah and try to get them to repent, and he would ultimately see the destruction of Jerusalem, and he would weep for her. But... As God said, to tear down and to plant, Jeremiah would also get to offer God's mercy, forgiveness, and hope to the people. Because he accepted his call, he got to prophesy the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Christ, and the return of Judah to Jerusalem. Jeremiah's story might actually seem kind of familiar to us. Because believe it or not, we're in the same boat. God has called all of us to follow Christ, and to do so, we will need to live and act as Christ followers. We will need to be God's voice, God's hands, God's feet, God's love, mercy, hope, and more. In Ephesians 2.10 we read, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are called to work for God. God is calling us to do work of the kingdom. In a verse that you should all know, and I'm sure you've heard many times, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we read, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. I want you to hear that. He doesn't say, therefore come and sit down an hour a week. Jesus says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the, Holy, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We're not alone. God has called all of us to work. We are a part of the larger body of Christ in the church. And God has sent us help in Christ and in the Spirit. So we should heed the warning signs in our lives and answer God's call. Because you never know how God's upper story might be working through our lower story. In his book, When God Whispers, name, Max Lucado, tells the story of John Eglin, who had never preached a sermon in his life before the Sunday morning when it snowed a whole bunch and the pastor wasn't able to make it to the church. In fact, this man was the only deacon to show up that day. 
And he wasn't a preacher, but he was a faithful person. And that meant on that particular Sunday morning, he did volunteer and got up and preached. And God rewarded his faithfulness. And at the end of his hesitant sermon, one young man invited God into his heart. No one there could appreciate the significance of what had taken place on that morning. But the young man who accepted Christ that snowy Sunday morning was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the man who's been called the Prince of Preachers. God blessed Charles so much that when he was still less than 30 years old, he became the pastor of London's Metropolitan Tabernacle. His sermons were so powerful that although the building could hold 5,000 people, crowds would line up outside trying to hear him. This amazing life of faith all started on a cold Sunday morning with the faithfulness of a deacon who had never preached a sermon before that day. Faithfulness means being committed to what God lets us have, to when God lets us have the chance to do and to do it. Whether it looks like a big assignment or a small one, giving the sermon to a handful of people on a Sunday morning when almost no one shows up doesn't seem all that significant. But it demanded faithfulness. It demanded that somebody listen. And God blessed John Eglin's faithfulness and many more have been blessed because of it. One man turned from God's call and he became the most evil king ever. He turned an entire nation so far away from God that through him and his descendants, Jerusalem became a place of sin and corruption. That man was Manasseh. One man answered God's call. And he got to speak to a nation about the hope that was coming in the Messiah. And that man was Jeremiah. One man answered God's call. And he unknowingly brought another to Christ who would go on to influence millions. That man was John Eglin. You can ignore the warning signs in your life and continue down whatever path of self-destruction and sin you choose, you can be like Manasseh and wait until the very end to repent and God will love you and forgive you like Manasseh. Or you can answer God's call. Today, you can answer God's call. And who knows how God will use you to bring us all closer to the kingdom. We might not be able to see the significance of it today, but God is always at work.